personalization is data. And the kind of personalization data that we have is basically, um, you know, for example, uh, let's take a uh, look at example of search. It, it is number one, the aggregate data, all the users that have used a particular system uh, or have shopped on your site. And it's also, uh, because we have that aggregate data, we also have individual data. Segmentation makes a, a big difference in improving that. And that's exactly why we solve the problem like that. The beauty of our platform is that the thing that underlies the platform is what we call the customer data engine. By popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. Head to netsuite.com slash ionai. That's ionai, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Again, head to netsuite.com slash ionai. netsuite.com slash ionai for its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Yeah, so uh, Xin Wang, why don't you start by introducing yourself and then we'll start talking about Bloomreach. Okay. Uh, so, you know, my name in English is pronounced Zun Wang. Um, oh. It's actually correct that uh, in Chinese, it's a shrink. Yeah. But, uh, when I came to North America, it became very hard for people to not pronounce shrink. So I just tell people to pronounce it like Zun, like xylophone. Like oh, oh, that's interesting. Well, I got to tell you, I spent much of my adult life in China and well, so, uh, that's why you're pronouncing it actually correctly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and it drives me absolutely crazy when, uh, uh, news anchors refer to Xi Jinping and it's like, it's not that hard, you know, it's she just like he, she, but, uh, so yeah, that X, it really throws people in, uh, in uh, English language speaking countries for a loop. So that said, uh, yeah, where are you from in, in China? Yeah, so I was actually uh, born in Wuhan, China. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting because, um, you know, before 2019, people used to always ask me that, and I tell them Wuhan, China, and nobody would know where that is. <laughs> the Chicago like, of China, that's what people that's always what I say. say. Yeah. I, I always say that. I said, that's yeah. the Chicago of China. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then after 2019, everybody knows where Wuhan, China is at this point. Yeah. So uh, that's how I was born. <coughs> yeah. I uh, uh, to Canada uh, when I was very young. So I actually uh, went to Canada when I was seven years old. Um, and my father studied uh, in civil engineering at the University of Toronto. <coughs> there I was introduced to uh, the awesome world of computing. So I used to uh, use uh, computers to run uh, water simulations and understand water flows. Oh. That's where the interest came from. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as you requested, I'll give you a you know, brief overview of my career history and educational background. Uh, so, I actually went to university up in Canada, I went to the University of Waterloo. And oh, yeah. I studied, uh, computer engineering at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so, it was very focused on understanding the top to bottom of everything about computing technology stack. So everything from designing transistors and learning, you know, VHDL, Verilog, uh, to assembly language, to C++, uh, all the way up to learning about artificial intelligence and graphics design. It's a little bit different than the computer science, uh, you know, program in that was a little bit focused more on math and software. For us, we had a full breadth of knowledge from hardware all the way to software. So we also learned, you know, data structures and AI and all of those. Yeah. Um, I think we're also a lot on hardware side as well. Yeah. Um, I, then, I, I have to ask, were you there when Jeff Hinton was still teaching? No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Graduated in 2001. So okay. Yeah. Um, anyways, out of uh, university, I ended up uh, working at NVIDIA uh, for my last internship. That's where I really started my career. Uh, I joined NVIDIA right after IPO. I was something like a 500 employee there. We were still a pretty small company back then. And I uh, started my career very low level uh, driver work, writing video drivers for GeForce 2 MX, I think. And um, you know, working with Apple as well. At that generation, we had GeForces in, in Apple, uh, you know, computers. Um, and then it was actually you know the dawn of 
what would be the parallel computing powerhouse that NVIDIA is today. Remember, you know, uh, getting the announcement that we acquired 3DFX assets mm -hmm. and technology, and we really started continuing the work of 3DFX in, in building the GPU. Since they invested so much in that effort, they eventually went out of business. Uh, we kind of carried the torch from 3DFX uh, to be able to build the GPU. Uh, so that was the beginning of uh, in parallel computing. At that time, what I was working on is you know, optimizing, um, you know, using, a lot of people think NVIDIA as an AI company, and it absolutely is an AI company, but it really had its, uh, let's say, uh, you know, roots in, in parallel computing. And parallel computing can be used by a lot of things. And the first application of parallel computing was graphics, right? Yeah. So graphics and shaders. And what I was doing is I was trying to adapt the parallel computing architecture for acceleration of video encoding and decoding. So one of the algorithms of video decoding is massively parallel. There's a motion compensation is done at a macro block level. And you do you know, discrete cosine transforms and motion compensation calculations. And there, when you're dealing with anything massively parallel, you can leverage the GPU's parallel computing capabilities. So mm -hmm. being able to translate uh, these algorithms into massively parallel computing, uh, you know, um, programs and, and the structure needed to create that program is where I started my career at NVIDIA. Um, spent about 13, 15 years between 2000 and 2015 at NVIDIA, and then I, I worked up and more and more up the stack. The last thing I did was uh, working closely with Jensen. We have some co-patents together mm -hmm. on it. So we uh, developed uh, GeForce Now, which is a cloud gaming service that NVIDIA runs today. Um, so I led that effort, really created that you know, whole entire system for NVIDIA. Uh, and then when I finished that, I decided to uh, you know, try something new with my career. I'd already been there for 15 years and I decided to you know, go to a more uh, software-centric business. Mm -hmm. you know, NVIDIA is, is, is a great hardware business, you know, not on top of the world right now, uh, <laughs> but it's still very much a hardware business. And uh, you know, I wanted to go take my career more towards the software space. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I trans transitioned to a company called Medallia, which is an enterprise SaaS space. Uh, they deal with customer experience management. So I started there as a VP of engineering, managing their, their infrastructure deployment, their cloud deployment. So again, you know, sort of leveraging uh, the, the, the close to hardware, but going to data center and managing a lot of compute and the software to manage that compute is the role that I went to after that. Um, after about four years at Medallia, uh, I started a role at Bloomreach, where I've been for the past five years uh, as the CTO. So that was a, a good, I would say, transition for me in terms of uh, scope and responsibilities. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the first time for me to take on a truly executive role uh, and you know, working with the board, uh, working you know, with the other executive leaders, the CEO, uh, and as well, what really interested me about Bloomreach, and I'll answer the question about what Bloomreach does, is that it's it's very much um, the perfect blend for me about a technology focused company in artificial intelligence, as well as a software focused business uh, that is in the enterprise space. And to me, that was kind of just the perfect combination of uh, the place where I want to take my career. Yeah. Um, so I've been serving as the chief technology officer of Bloomreach for the past five years. And uh, you know, what we do at Bloomreach is we essentially provide an, an, an AI powered platform that optimizes uh, and helps um, you know, commerce customers, e-commerce customers, uh, retailers um, and uh, brands. Uh, we help these uh, folks basically deploy AI technology, deploy data to use that AI technology to increase their uh, you know, engagement with their users and increase their conversion rates for their business. You know, we see that uh, a lot of these businesses, they currently kind of lack the capabilities to develop, uh, you know, um, sophisticated AI technologies uh, to be able to leverage the best in the industry so that they can go and just make their websites more better for uh, searches, for uh, the experience. And that always leads to you know, more loyal customers and leads to higher conversion rates. And, and, you know, we believe that we are providing this foundation of technology platform that gives them access to these state-of-the-art technologies so they can reach those business goals. So that's what we do here at Bloomreach. We implement that using uh, you know, several uh, distinct products, 
There's one product focused on search, we call it discovery. So that's um, you know a lot of the uh, the interactions with the website in terms of hitting the search box. So if you go to uh, you know Gap today and you hit the search box and you type in you know, jackets, right? yeah. that search engine is powered by Bloomberg's technology. So the results that you see based on that query, the artificial intelligence you deploy to return those results in terms of semantic relevancy, in terms of you know um, what you might want to see and. Uh, in terms of popularity and personalized behavior, uh, you get that result from the Bloom Reach engine on Discovery. Mm. As well, we provide you know the uh, recommendation widgets that you see, the more like this, the just for you, and all these things that you see on the website. Even though we don't build out the website, that is the responsibility of the customer's engineering team. Basically, the core technology that delivers that information to you is powered by Bloom Reach. That's one. Uh, of the distinct parts. And so uh, just uh, to jump in, the uh, customer then uh, would, uh, w w an e-commerce customer would engage Bloomreach to, to power the recommendation engine and the search and uh, what, what, what are the, and, and to track KPIs and, and that sort of thing. What, what's the role? I've I've read about Lumi AI. What is Lumi AI, and how does that fit in the uh, in the Bloomreach product suite? Yeah, so we, you think of Lumi AI as a it, it's it's a brand that we have, which describes all of the uh, different AI services and capabilities as part of our platform. So it's not really just one thing. It, it is how we you know piece all of these services together to. You know, present that into you know one one brand that we call Lumi. So as part of that brand, there is basically the search service. So the search service is part of the Lumi uh, umbrella, and there's the recommendation service. Now, how this is implemented underneath search is actually very different than recommendations, and they use uh, a different technology stack and a different algorithm. And there's pieces that are similar here and there, but ultimately they're exposed as basically a separate API. So if you look at Lumi as a whole, you have a search API, right? you have a recommendations API, you have a segmentation API, you have all of these different APIs that make up what we call the Lumi intelligence. Uh, Bloomreach's uh, uh, thesis is uh, personalization, is that right? To deliver personalized experiences. Wh how does that work? And, and wh what is... Uh, when you talk about segmentation in this context, what is a segment-based strategy? Yeah, so you know we have a big part to play in personalization, uh, but I also want to highlight that you know beyond personalization, uh, you know in an abstract way or generalized way, what we're doing is we're really making use of data as well as artificial intelligence, and we put those two together to be able to uh, you know deliver the outside value to our customers and just create better experiences. Now, personalization is one aspect of it because personalization is data, right? And the kind of personalization data that we have is basically, um, you know, for example, uh, let's take a uh, look at example of search. It, it is number one, the aggregate data, of all the users that have used uh, a particular system uh, or have shopped on a particular site, right? And it's also, uh, because we have that aggregate data, we also have individual data. Now, one thing I'll highlight is that, you know, we are focused on personalization in a highly compliant way. So um, we very much believe in the principle of you know, deploying AI and usage of data in a very ethical way. And, you know, we're, we're not like a company out there that delivers only one service, but we're harvesting data and selling to somewhere else. You know, we're, we're not like that kind of company. You know, what we do is we provide a technology platform so that the brands can build a real relationship with their end users. And they have the permission of the end users to be able to collect this data. So if you're, if you're like, okay, I don't want to be tracked with my shopping experience because I want to yeah. have private data, you can opt out. And you know, it's just like the cookie uh, consent. You have the ability to consent whether or not you want to be tracked or not. Or if you want your email address to be, you know, uh, to be part of uh, the brand system. Now, 
the brands will, of course, entice you to go and, you know, uh, click yes or, you know, sign up for an email and they will give you incentives like coupons or other, uh, other ways. But ultimately, you know, the decision is on the end user. So the end user gets to make a decision whether or not they have, they're consenting to tracking and leveraging the data and AI services our platform gives. So that's number one. I want to make that very clear. Um, now, how we make use of that data is, is a multi -fold. Because of all the people who have opted in, we have all the aggregate data of the experiences that is on a particular website. And now we can apply data science, machine learning to get insights out of that data to be able to turn that around into value. So, um, you know, at, at an aggregate level, we can do some very simple things. For example, we can understand which products in which category is just sells well, it's very popular. A lot of people are buying this one product probably means that product is pretty good. There's something about it. Even though we don't, you know, the system has never, you know, computer system has never tried a jacket, you know, obviously, but it knows from the data of the usage that there's something about this jacket that everybody else likes and have purchased. Therefore, we will then assign a higher, uh, you know, um, score to this particular jacket over other jackets. And when we go search for jackets, then we might uh, rank that higher than other jackets because mm -hmm that discover score because of the ultimate uh, overall usage, right? So that's one way to do it um, uh, in terms of the value that we put. Uh, in terms of uh, direct personalization, we have two levels of personalization. One is segmented personalization. And we create segment personalization uh, ultimately because, you know, we do think that, uh, uh, you know, aggregate customer behavior um, often goes along in segments. And this observation has come from our other product, which is the engagement product. So on one side, we deliver experiences for the customer's uh, web, web experience. On the other side, we also deliver the experience from your inbox experience or your SMS experience. Uh, you know, when you get an email from a brand that you trust and you like, and they tell you about a campaign or a promotion, a coupon, a Christmas sale, that message that's delivered into your inbox comes from another product that we have called the engagement product. So engagement product is using data and using marketing automation to be able to send you those emails, send you those messages, again, in a highly personalized way. And what these two applications have in common is the personalization data. It knows about both the aggregate usage of all customers on the system, and it knows about your personal usage, right? As long as you, again, consent to do it. So, you know, it knows what have you looked at in the past. If you went and searched for jackets and pants and shoes, we now have a history that you went and, you know, searched for those things, right? If you bought something, we know that, right? So what we're able to do then is we're able to turn that around and based on the things that you have purchased before, take the next guess at what you might want in the future, right? That's one way we can go about it. Um, and, and those things we expose through our APIs, like the recommendations APIs. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much the same as, uh, you know, if you go on YouTube and TikTok, you get recommendations, right? And the right. recommendations are personalized to you. And those recommendations are basically figured out by the system using machine learning algorithms and similar ones that we deploy. You know, two towers, two towers architecture for recommendations is kind of standard practice. You find that on. YouTube, Netflix, eBay, and we use a similar type of mechanism, except for products. Right? So we can then, uh, you know, based on that, and I can go into more details of what that means. But but based on you know the the, the aggregate data and your personal taste, try to predict what you might be interested. In. And therefore, you might see an email that is a lot more relevant to you uh, compared to something else. Right? Now, um, you know that, that's one benefit, but the, the company. Actually, uh, engagement is, is from a previous company called Esponia. This actually started with an even simpler use case. And, and, and the sort of the, the use case of uh, the, the history of this uh, Esponia company uh, is the story where, you know, one of the founders of this company, and we, we got Ex Exponia through an acquisition because, you know, we felt that uh, CDP and consent and privacy and GDPR are super important to what we're doing. So that's why we went to go acquire this company. But how the company first started, and this is a bit of a, urban legend is that uh, you know the, the one of the founders was uh, was a gamer pc gamer 
So he was buying video games, right? And he had just bought a video game one day. He was very happy. And then the next day after that, he got an email for a coupon and a promotion for that same video game. <laughs> you know, and, and I think I've had that experience before. Uh, my yeah. wife has that experience before. And you're just like, ugh, very frustrated that like I just got something and then like well my well my my does she actually goes like you know calls people up and go hey we just got a coupon give me a refund or something right so it, it frustrates a lot of people when that happens right so the initial engagement system is actually built to solve a very simple problem just to prevent that from happening you know yeah. don't send me an email of a coupon of something that I just bought right now how does a computer system do that well because computer system can only do that if it knows about your past purchase history, which is a form of simple personalization. And that's where it started. You know, just don't send me any emails that <laughs> makes me upset. You know? Uh, so that's just one simple form. And our system has all the capabilities to allow the brands to fix that. You know, because we have the data, we have the tool set, we have the data to be able to solve for that use case. And now we've gone even beyond that. Now we've gone beyond that to hey, not just make you upset but let's show you things of value using the new technology like neural networks embeddings and all of these things um, to drive the engagement so that, that, that's one that's an example of one-to-one -one personalization but we also know that there's a, a segment <coughs> of behavior, well, there's people behave in groups you know there's a group of shoppers that very similarly shops in, in the same way and and brands today they need a tool to be able to target that segment and, and that is derived from the fact that there is business intelligence uh, in humans to understanding their business and the other thing that we fundamentally believe in is that ai and humans have to work together we have to provide a bridge so that you know ai doesn't know everything maybe someday it will but it's not today <laughs> they don't know everything about everything they don't know everything about a business they don't know everything about people right and we want the tools and the platform to be there, but ultimately we want humans to go and add this extra insight that the AI doesn't know, right? And that's why we built a fairly configurable platform that has a ton of capabilities for a human user, whether it be a marketer or a merchandiser. For you to go there and for something, just a simple example, you can define your segments. You know, you can design your segments as, you know, middle-aged men in North America. Or something yeah. because we, you believe that you know those folks will be interested in a certain campaign or a certain segment of your product and now you can go into the tool and go and you know build that segment and you can say well you know region uh, you know gender uh, and so forth and then you build that segment right now once you have that segment you can do a bunch of things with it. you can go then and build campaigns and websites based on that segment so that when uh, a user from that segment comes to your website and that's the third product we have, which is content management system. That is sort of the bones of the website, right? That you will see something that is personalized to your segment and not, uh, you know, another segment, right? So uh, middle-aged men like us in North America, we'll see one page that may be interesting to us. The layout of the page, the content of the page is interesting to us. And then somebody else in another segment may see something else, right? So that's one way of doing segmented personalization. But we have to realize that this is uh, in all forms. So in, in addition to segmented personalization, there's also one-to-one -one personalization, right? So we might see a similar landing page that describes our segment for the segment that we belong to, but our individual recommendations for the products within that segment might be customized to us, right? So that's what Blue Reach does. We cover both the segmented personalization as well as the one-to-one -one personalization of your website experience, both in terms of the landing in terms of the you know search results and in certain terms of the emails that you get or, or messages or omni channels not only emails but you know omni channel messages of engagement that you get from our, our products and that's how all these things tie together you know when when so sort of every aspect of the commerce experience can now be segment uh, can be personalized at these different levels so that you truly get you know the benefit of uh, ai machine learning as well as the human knowledge and insights about markets, segments, and knowing their customers. Yeah, uh, on the uh, personalization or on the data that that you collect uh, to generate to to drive the personalization, do you buy uh, uh, third party data? And I asked because I I had a guy in the podcast uh, 
a few years ago during the last election cycle uh, who was in fundraising, and they had a system. They would buy data from all these different data brokers, and, uh, you know, he, he could, uh, you know, they would have maybe 100 columns uh, per uh, individual donor. So for me, if I had ever donated to a campaign, my name would be in the, it would, I would have a line in that database and then the columns would go out to, you know, what magazines I subscribe to or what, uh, you know, all these different data points, uh, that they had aggregated through different brokers. And it gave them a very fine grained, uh, sense of who the individual donor is and how to approach them. And do you, do you do that sort of thing? We do not do that. You know, I think, uh, some of those activities, you know, we believe are borderline on the matter of ethics. And yeah. what, the only thing we deal with is first party data. And that is, yeah, that, that's basically the, the brand and retailer that you have a relationship with, you know, you build trust with them, you consent to having, you know, data be tracked by them and then we deliver that platform to this brand and retailer so that they can go and, and manage that in a compliant first party. Yeah. But on the personalization, I mean I'm, you know, everyone shops online these days, but I rarely I don't buy that much. So let's say it's a shoe company. I may or eyeglass company. I may buy a pair of eyeglasses once and never visit that site again for five years. So the, it's pretty sparse data uh, to to personalize something for me. How, how do you, I guess that's where segmentation comes in. Is that right? Exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, segmentation makes a, a big difference in improving that. And that's exactly why we solve the problem like that. You're exactly right that one-to-one -one personalization is deployed well on TikTok and YouTube because you're watching YouTube and TikTok every day probably. That's right. right. It builds up a ton of data about you so that it can really go and say. So we realize exactly as you say that a lot of customers may only have a sparse data set of individual users. And that's why we uh, approach very much the segmented uh, personalization based on segments developed uh, by the customer using their intuition. Because they also realize they have the same problem as well. You know, every marketer out there knows that, hey, this customer, you can't bank on them being a return loyal customer, but you got to get their attention, even if they're a one-time customer, you know, and, and you have to try to zero in as best you can. And that's why we've uh, built a whole sophistication around uh, building segments and the AI that utilizes those segments to go and empower all these experiences. Uh, so yeah. exactly. Yeah, I have. Uh, I would imagine you have. Do you have data on uh, how effective uh, Bloomreach is? Uh, maybe uh, sales data before implementing uh, Bloom or Lumi AI or Bloomreach's products, and then uh, sales data after, so you can see the lift. Absolutely. Now it, it's it's different from different parts of a product. For example, if you implement search right uh, as an AI. Uh, it has you know some personalization, it has segment personalization, and it has also just the AI intelligence of semantic understanding uh, of natural language, which you need to understand your intent, like whatever you typed in your query box, as well as the product uh, semantic information, like the words in the product catalog. So it uses all of these things to provide you the optimal search results. So if you enable everything, then you can see a lift like assuming that you don't have any of these technologies, you know, up to like 60 to 80%. Wow. You know, when you put all of these things, right? But again, that's compared to if you're not doing any of these things, yeah. you just all you're doing is just returning a bunch of search results based on a keyword search, then you, you know, obviously you're not benefiting from any of these machine learning and AI technologies. So if you adopt all of these things, the lift could be massive, you know? Um, and, and for marketing, similarly, when we, uh, you know, use the data to personalize, even in the simple case of not showing you, you know, a, a coupon based on a product you just bought, you put all of that together, you're again looking at, you know, more than 50 to 60% click through rates uh, in terms of, you know, opening that email. So on engagement, we track a little bit different. You know, it's not like they convert directly after uh, they click on an email, but we track what is the click through rate? How many times does sending you an engagement email end up, uh, you know, 
bringing you onto the site. When we track that, then that is actually increasing, you know, 50, 60% our uh, engagement rate. Are the customers, are they generally uh, very large e-commerce platforms? Uh, I mean, is this an expensive solution that uh, that uh, really is targeting, uh, you know, Amazon scale e-commerce uh, platforms, or or do you get down to the smaller mom and pop e-commerce platforms? How how what's the sort of bell curve on your uh, on your customer base? Yeah, so we are not a small medium business. So we position our ISP towards the mid-market and also enterprise segment. So we have uh, some of the biggest uh, enterprises in uh, U.S. And, and, and Europe, you know, big uh, retailers like uh, Total Wine, Staples. You know, Staples actually is like the top two or third in terms of traffic in e-commerce in all the U.S. You get Amazon and then I think, you know, maybe Staples right after that, surprisingly, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it goes all the way up to the enterprise, but we also have smaller brands as well. But generally, they are of a mid-market size rather than a small medium size. Yeah, and how do you guys uh, price this? I mean, as you said, there's there are different uh, APIs or different products. Uh, are, is there a, a bundle? Uh, do you get a discount if you buy the bundle, or and is it a subscription? Or I have to say that I'm not on the pricing and packaging yeah, side. Yeah, so, sure. You know, those detailed questions might be better answered. But in general, we have a subscription-based revenue business. Right, right. That usually comes with some kind of base subscription platform fee and then a usage-based fee. Because you know, if you do use more API calls, because hopefully your business is doing great and you're getting a whole bunch of traffic to your site, it does cost us more to serve that. There's you yeah, know, of course. Yeah. and so forth. So it's it's you know large in general half and half platform fee versus a usage fee. Yeah, and where do you see this technology going? Uh, uh, do you are are you, is Bloomreach investing in in uh, further research, and do you follow the research because this is uh, clearly a pretty active area of research? And how much uh, generative AI are you using in the in the product suite? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, at Bloomreach, we are constantly innovating, and even personally, I have a goal of reading. Uh, four white papers a week um, wow. based on my responsibilities. <laughs> you know, so I was just digging into uh, Google Gemma 2 white paper last night and, uh, you know, just taking all of that in and then extracting the parts that are useful to us, connecting dots and passing that on to my team. So we very much are in the cycle of, of innovation. Uh, we're constantly in the cycle of innovation. Um, you know, some of what we're trying to do right now uh, is very much related to generative AI. But, you know, generative AI is a, um, it's a term that I think is a little bit misleading. You know, ultimately, it, it is about uh, large uh, language models and small language models. It's about language models. You know, for us, uh, you know, a very important part of this is uh, having an AI system that is able to understand human language. That is what I think is the most important about, about it. It is more than sort of like generating music. Now, you know, I love generating music. That's fun to do, but that's not how we leverage technology. So it's not really yeah. generating technology, uh, generating uh, output. It's more, um, you know, interesting for us to understand human language, and you know, the unlock of large and small language models today is is huge. And it's a very disruptive in uh, what we do because if you think about the core things that we do, it's about understanding human intent, right? So uh, you know, we've uh, been investing in this for several years now, and now we are about to roll out Lumi Search Plus. That's one of the areas. And, and Lumi Search Plus basically leverages this new technology. Um, and it leverages uh, language models to enhance search. Uh, at least one part of Lumi Search Plus does that, right? But we also research and develop in traditional machine learning methods as well. So along with Lumi Search Plus, we're leveraging the core technology of generative AI, which is large language models, okay, into our core search system. And what that does is it gives you uh, much higher relevance. And I can give you some pretty fun examples that I personally went into that describes why it is so important to do this. Uh, but in the other side, I'll just sort of broaden this out, 
Uh, we also leverage uh, machine learning, sort of classic machine learning, to go and ingest signals, again, all first party signals that the customers give us and naturally learn uh, what is more important to be able to help you rank a particular product in a particular position, right? Like I said before, when you think about the problem of ranking a search result, right? You need to take in many things into account. One thing is the relevance of what you're looking for. For example, if you type in jackets, you want to see jackets, right? Uh, that's an intent to product catalog. And that relevance score needs to be pretty high. But it's not also, you know, um, the only thing that we look at. If we only rank for relevance, that likely won't give you the highest revenues. We also need a score, for example, what sells well, you know, what is popular based on the intent. So, and what is your personal affinity? Maybe you like blue jackets more than red jackets or something, right? Mm -hmm. So when you put all this together, you have a scoring system that is based on all of these signals. And then that's what results into your ranking equation, uh, ranking uh, accepting kickback. Uh, ultimately, the question then becomes, well, how much weight do you put on each of these signals? Should you put a high weight on text relevance, uh, medium weight on something? How does the system even figure out what the weight is? So there, we've also added another innovation that we call Learn to Rank, which powers our what we call the AI Studio. So Learn to Rank is a deep neural network that also tries to learn from the usage data. What is the optimal amount of weighting on these scores to give you the optimal outcome for yeah. revenue, right? So not only does Lumi Search Plus advance in our way of leveraging uh, large language models and, and generative AI, quote unquote, to be able to give you best, better search relevance. But we're also advancing in classic machine learning methods to help you rank better, looking just at scores and numbers. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're, we're basically constantly going in, uh, and, and continue to invest in these technologies to optimize further uh, your results and increasing the lift, increasing the engagement. And then a lot of other things we're doing with uh, Bloomberg Clarity is a change in the way that you even experience e-commerce. So we have different tracks of innovation in terms of enhancing what we currently do, leveraging latest cloud technologies, and then using the latest technologies in the example of Bloomreach Clarity, completely changing the customer experience from mm -hmm. engaging in a search box and recommendations to actually conversing with a sales agent. I mean, Clarity is kind of uh, our virtual sales agent. And that leverages uh, large language models as well, quote unquote, generative AI, to go and speak to you and to understand your input in a natural language form. You can ask it, hey, does this uh, mattress have a warranty or not? And then it will be able to respond to you, yeah, it has a warranty of two or three years. You know, no longer just a search problem, anymore, but it's an interaction, information of exchange uh, type of experience that uh, we've seen that leads to also much higher conversions. So we're deploying these new, talk, new technologies in, in very different ways across our platform. Um, you know, those are just some examples. Yeah, uh, uh, for example, on the on the uh, conversational uh, or virtual assistant, uh, do, are you relying on the customer to collect the data and and feed it to Bloomreach? Or do you uh, build in uh, data collection uh, systems in their platform? For example, <clears throat> most e-commerce sites now have a virtual assistant or at least a chat function. Do you collect that uh, data and process it for uh, personalization? Or uh, are you relying on on the, the e-commerce uh, company to collect it and then turn it over to you? Yeah. So the beauty of our platform is that the thing that underlies the platform is what we call the customer data engine. And the customer data engine is what I consider an evolution of the customer data platform. So the, the company evolved from uh, you know, CDP at its core, but we've started adding more intelligence on top of the CDP, which is why we call it the CDE, customer data engine. Now, the purpose of the customer data engine is to, number one, help the customer collect the data of the usage, right? So uh, you know, when you go and, and purchase a product like Clarity, you get the underlying CDE platform with it. Right. Now, the underlying CD platform allows the customer to go and manage and feed data into this platform 
again, in a completely GDP power, CCPA compliant way, where you know it's all first party data. And the customer can then use our platform to both acquire the data uh, sort of directly into the platform. So we give them a, a pixel, an API, we say, you can collect this data by integrating this into your website. So you put this pixel on your website, and then when customers go and browse this, clicks on something or purchase something, uh, then it will automatically go into the platform. Or here's an API to import data. So if you have data from past previous purchase history that you have, or you have in-store data from you know the experience of people at in-store, you can have a way to import that data directly into a platform. So you can have both of those ways. But once it goes into our platform, then we use that platform to directly power uh, our Bloom Reach Clarity, which is this personalized experience. So then Clarity will know some simple things. First of all, what context are you in? You know, one of the key things we wanted to do with Clarity is differentiate the experience from what you normally see uh, other people doing, which is um, you know you might see a little icon at the bottom of your screen and you click it and a chat assistant comes up. We actually don't think that that is a, a smart way to go about it because really how many people go to the right box and click the, the message box and go chat with someone, right? Uh, the way that we think about it is that you know uh, we try to mirror the retail experience that people have. Uh, mm -hmm. When you go to a store, if you're looking for something and you know what you want to look for, you know where it is, just don't bug me. You know, I, I think that, that that's kind of the, the mantra that I have. I go to a store and want to look and browse and just do whatever I have. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to right. go and maybe I want to browse, want to look and just, you know, leave me alone, right? Uh, don't, don't push something in my face. I just, I really dislike it when a salesperson just like, hey, can I help you? And it's like, I don't need any help from that. It's okay. Um, I, so we want, you know, uh, the, the Clarity product to only intercept when there's a high probability that uh, a user is looking for help. So in a store, you know, the good sales assistants, they know this. They know when to leave you alone because you're obviously browsing or just going in and picking something up and leaving. But when they see you like confused and sometimes I do this thing where I'm like looking around and like what's going on. And then I'm like, I'm about to head out the store because like I just can't find what I'm looking for. Then the good sales agent, agent, sales agent would go and intercept me and go, hey, sir, I, I see you looking a little bit confused. Is there something I can help you with? Some more information I give you? A and then I start that engagement and I go, okay, yeah, um, you know, I, I was really looking for this thing, but I have no idea what I'm looking for. And, uh, you know, can you help me? Here's a picture, you know, da, da, da. And then that conversation engages. And a lot of the times they actually help me find the product and that leads to a conversion. So when we think about that experience, what we're trying to do with Clarity is mirror that experience. And a part of clear, a big part of Clarity is doing that interception the right way. We don't inter, we don't just pop up when you don't want it. You know, we don't want to just put a little icon so that you never visit it. It's just like a sales assistant that sits in the corner. It's not like that, right? So we use machine learning to just and personalization data to figure out, well, you know, if you've been looking around and you're not sure, we have a you know model to try to figure out what is the highest probable time to engage. Then we will go and pop something up. We'll go, hey, we saw you looking at this product and you might be confused. Can I help you with answering something about this product? So it's in context. It knows about your behavior and it's trying to optimize that first engagement experience. You know, so that's one of the ways that uh, we differentiate from just any of these other sales assistant uh, things that you see online where you're either forced to engage or it's a little box there that you'll have to go click. Yeah, and and I would imagine uh, since you you can't, there's only so much data you could get uh, from a customer interaction on an e-commerce site, but there's a lot of research into predictive analytics and and you're know, working with sparse data to to improve predictions. Uh, are you? Is that a direction that 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 you guys are headed, or where where is this this headed in on the research side? Yeah, so we already have um, predictive analytics as part of our platform, but if you look at you know um, what we have to do to work around this problem of sparse data, mm -hmm. a lot of it leads to basically collaborative filtering uh, or defined segments, meaning that even if you have small one data. Because you train the model with aggregate data set, you're not working with just one person's own experience. You're working with the experience of a lot of people that actually are very similar. 
So if you know that you know you have a similar profile of a person, and you know that other people of this profile are interested in these things, and because we have all of that data, right, then we can make very uh, or, or not not very, but like the best guess prediction on what uh, an individual could do with only just one data point. And and that's where a lot of it's not necessarily just predictive analytics capabilities, but even the recommendations algorithm, like two towers, it does exactly that. It utilizes collaborative filtering trained into a neural network. And the neural network is basically doing similar things that what predictive, you know, generative AI is a predictive technology, actually. It's just, it's trying to predict the next token, right? Everything about AI these days is really about probabilities. You know, yep. You're not 100% sure that the next word is the right word. But because a lot of other people said these words in context with the other words, then it may be this word. You know, it's very similar in trying to predict shopping behavior. A lot of people react in this way, and they're of a similar profile, and they're interested in that. There's high probability that you're interested in this next action, or you're interested in this next product. And all the algorithms are basically along that form in some way or the other. Well, it's interesting when you uh, talked about the... Uh... Uh, the recommendations uh, or or the engagement and, you know, buying something and then two days later, you know, getting a coupon for a discount on what you have already bought. One of the things, and I'm sure this will go away, but uh, that that has always bothered me is when I buy a shovel and suddenly every time I go on YouTube for the next week, I'm getting fed ads of shovels it's like well i already bought a shovel i don't need more ads of shovels is how do you avoid that well you know it, it, it just uh, so happens that uh, you know with uh, youtube and a lot of the large data systems uh, they, they tend to share data through a data exchange and uh, you know they're not a single system as well you know so uh, you have a lot of back-end systems that treat data in a, a very siloed sort of way. So, you know, the information that it got about the shovel purchase that you made, it might have an incomplete set of that data because it knows that you search for a shovel. Does it know that you actually transacted on right. a shovel? It doesn't know that. So that's why it only passes the information that you search for a shovel into these other systems that doesn't know that you actually bought a shovel. That's why it's showing you more shovels, right? That is an issue of disparate systems because of the heterogeneous nature of companies and the subsystems that support these companies, right? Now, the good news for Bloomreach is, you know, we operate in a segment of the market that's not like that. Like I said, we work with the brands and the brand basically owns that relationship with you. So it has the actual transaction information along with the search information. So if you have the transaction with the search information, then even without advanced AI, even with simple rules, you can build in into the recommendations widget, hey, if someone already bought item X, don't show any categories of item X. And that becomes yeah. a, a simple rule that can just prevent that problem because you have one system that is dedicated to this one brand of retail. Yeah. On, on, uh, you, you now power, I, I saw a data point that is like a quarter of all e-commerce websites in the U.S. and U.K. Is that right? Yes, that is by, I think, uh, volume of traffic. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, a big part of that, again, comes from Staples. <laughs> if you look at the volume of traveling, you know, yeah, this is very surprising to me as well. It's like Amazon and then Staples. So because we have Staples, that makes in a large part of the, of the traffic in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, another thing I, I read is uh, uh, a reference to two tower neural networks uh, to enhance personalization. What is a two tower neural network? Yeah. Now, th this one is uh, <laughs> you can get pretty deep into estimation here. but. Okay. I will say here that uh, basically two towers is the same algorithm that YouTube and uh, you know um, TikTok and other sites uh, that fundamentally how they provide to you uh, recommendations you know based on the, this the same architecture of the algorithm and the, the concept behind this algorithm is uh, really that you are using a combination of collaborative filtering uh, mm -hmm. with a um, ability to 
understand features of products and uh, you know, or, or the corpus of the, the products using embedding models. And you put those two things together to be able to fill in the gaps in a, a much more accurate way than it was before, right? So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a simple example of this. Uh, if you look at Netflix, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you try to figure out, well, if I watched, uh, you know, the, the movie, The Matrix, okay, uh, will I have a high probability of watching a movie like um, uh, The Arrival, <laughs> which is another sci-fi movie, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So if you look at this simple example, there's a couple of ways you can, you can solve this problem, right? Uh, one way is you can say, well, The Matrix, what kind of movie is The Matrix? Right. You can say, well, it's a sci-fi movie, number one, genre, sci-fi. You know, it's a noir detective movie. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what is Arrival? Well, Arrival is a sci-fi movie, and it's a uh, more, I don't know, political movie. <laughs> I'm just making this yeah. up. <laughs> right? So you can assign attributes to these movies. And you go, well, you know, if Zun likes sci-fi movies, then he might like another sci-fi movie. It's a very simple correlation. Right? Uh, we call that content filter as a, as a mechanism to find a correlation, right? Now, a previous recommendation system has done exactly things like that. But what it misses is, number one, the attributes of the movie matrix may go beyond what you define. You might have to define a thousand attributes because the matrix is about a lot of things. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a sci-fi movie. It's a normal movie. It also has, you know, Keanu Reeves. Maybe you like Keanu Reeves. And it has all of these different attributes that you may not be able to define in your algorithm in a hard-coded way, right? So that's one, um, you know, problem with you're not highly accurate in your relationship of these different attributes. And Two Towers architecture is a way to solve that. It solves that by using neural networks and embeddings. Embedding as a, a you know um, a concept, uh, what it does is it bakes in human knowledge into really a giant neural network. Yeah. And if you feed something like the matrix into this neural network, and maybe a description of it, the name, you know, all this information about the matrix into the neural network, it generates a, a number representation of all of those concepts, right? And it places this into a multi-dimensional vector space. So vector space could be up to like 900 parameters, right? And it's just a bunch of numbers, like 0 0.5, 0 0.3, but then it's 900 numbers. Now that space encompasses the meaning of all of these things, of Keanu Reeves, of like, you know, sci-fi, of noir, right. all of these things, right? And then what it does is it tries to does a match between the uh, mathematical di distance between this and the movie Arrival. And we feed everything into the arrival uh, as well. You know, it's a sci-fi movie, it has these actors and so forth, right? So by doing that, what you're doing is you no longer are reliant on someone manually defining genre, actors, yeah. something. It just discovers these things by itself and it's able to find that correlation by itself, which becomes a very accurate and powerful concept. You know? yeah. And then the other concept is basically collaborative filtering, which is, you know, if you like the matrix and you like another movie and somebody else liked the matrix and another movie, we can use that aggregate data set, feed it into another neural network. So you take the embeddings and you have like a, a personal, uh, you know, item history. So the movies that you watch, the items that you purchase, and then you have a product, uh, you know, catalog uh, embedding. And you take these two and you put them together. That's what the two towers are. One is your user history embedding or your profile embedding. And one is the product embedding. You put these two, two, two together and you put them into another neural network to train the aggregate data set so that it makes a prediction. And then when another person comes in, then you do the embedding for both of these again. You go, okay, he only, this person watched the matrix once and uh, you know, here's the matrix put them together, you put it into this neural network, and then it generates a prediction. And you go, most likely you would like to watch the arrival at 0.7% probability, you know, or 70% probability. Or you might like watching Avatar with, you know, 60% probability. That's how 
in a, in a nutshell, two towers architecture. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, and and we spoke earlier about capturing data through uh, interaction with virtual assistants. Uh, you have a product, Bloomreach Clarity, is that right? That's a conversational shopping assistant. Correct. Yes. And so that is the 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 customer takes that and puts it on their website. They're not using their own virtual assistant uh, and feeding you the data. They're they're using your architecture. Yes, yes. So again, this goes back to what I was saying about when the customer purchases Clarity, they get the underlying data platform that allows them to right. either gather first part of the data or feed in imported data, and then they get the Clarity module on top of that. And the Clarity I see. module has the you know uh, intelligence to be able to intercept the user in a more intelligent way than just placing it on a web page. The customer can also just place it on a web page. I mean, there's you know flexibility. I think mean, one of the questions we talked about before is how do we serve so many customers? We have like yeah. thousand customers. You know, they all each want different things, but we are a highly customizable platform. We provide APIs, we provide configurations, we provide rules. We even tr provide training models natively on a per customer basis. So customers can take all four of those toolboxes and do what they want with it. If they feel they want to use our interception algorithm, they can choose to do that. Or if they just want to make it show up all the time, they can choose to do that as well. I'm going to look at e-commerce websites uh, entirely in an entirely new light now. By popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program for a few more weeks. Head to netsuite.com slash IonAI. That's IonAI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Again, head to netsuite.com slash IonAI. Netsuite dot com slash ion ai for its one-of-a-kind flexible financing program 